Hello everybody and welcome back to a, another top 10 list for the Meeple Marathon. Today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 most influential games and these are influential games to me. These are not necessarily games that had the most impact on the industry, the games that had the most impact on myself as a gamer um, and throughout my whole childhood. So I'm going to be diving back into some older games but also talking about some newer games that really had a, a large influence on me in the industry. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so for number 10, and these are somewhat ranked in order of influence for me, is Harry Potter uh, Hogwarts Battle. This is a uh, deck building game, and the reason it is on my list is because it is was really my first um, dive into deck building. Um, I purchased this game almost entirely because of the theme. It was the first real game that looked like it had some strategy involved and was more than just like Harry Potter Monopoly. And I was really into the theme. My wife was really into the theme. And this is one of the few games that uh, my wife will, will sit down and play with me on a regular basis. We both really enjoy it. And after having played this game, we uh, dove in and... <clears throat> Um, uh, uh, I dove in and really started to enjoy the deck building genre and now it's one of my my favorite uh, kind of game elements to, to take part in and I think it is a great game. I know there's some people who are really harsh on it, say it's too simple, say it's too hard when it gets near the end. I think it's a great balance um, of both of those and the theme just really comes through for a deck builder. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at it. Okay, so um, you will notice that this is set up not in how the box would look like when you first open the game, but this is how uh, the box is going to look when you have played through the entirety of the base game and the expansion. First of all, I love the fact that the board just has this one side on it that looks like the Marauder's Map. It sits up on top, uh, really gets you in the mood as soon as you open up the box. Um, but essentially here it is a standard deck builder, but you also have these health um, boards, these character boards that you're going to be tracking your health on. Um, you can take hits just as well as, as they can take hits. And when you run out of health, you're not out of the game, you're just stunned and that advances the villain objective a little bit. Um, makes you discard half your hand, but then at the end of it you you move up back here to the top And you actually cannot be hurt any more than you already are if you're stunned So say you get stunned right at the beginning of your turn. You could accomplish a lot um, You know without fear of taking on further wounds into your hand uh, other than that it is essentially a uh, deck builder here and you can see that there is just a ton of content be warned, I guess minor spoilers here, but um, you know, you've got spells that, that give you things. You've got items like Hogwarts history, and then you have uh, allies. Here, there's a better one. This is uh, Dumbledore. He comes in the main box, the, the very first box, but you can see that he's gonna cost eight. And then essentially it does not, you don't have to pay, as long as he's in your hand, you can use him. And then you get the choice of Actually, he gives you all three of these. So the little lightning bolt is the attack symbol. The circle is the money, and then heart is health. And he gets lets you draw a card. So um, what's really awesome about this game is that when you first open it up, you're going to be introduced with all of these boxes that's going to say game one, game two, game three, all the way up to game seven. And essentially, each of those boxes is like the books. So if you are a fan of the books, opening up each one and being introduced to allies that you would be introduced to in those books and items and villains and all of, you know, you're not going to see uh, villains that you don't see at the very beginning of um, in, in the books. You're not going to see them like, I don't know if you noticed, Professor Karkaroff was in there. He does not appear till the, the fourth game um, because he's in the fourth book. And um, essentially, really, you just are um, 
Let me see if I can find here. So here's some, some dark arts cards. You're essentially having to deal with one of these per game. You can see like this one says active hero loses a heart and then you add one of these uh, steel skulls to the location. The location, if they are filled with skulls, that means that the villains, uh, the, the, the bad guys have taken over that location and it advances to the next. And you need to defeat all of the villains um, by knocking them all out before the villains all take over all of the locations. Usually there's three in a game. Um, and, and so you're wanting to keep those from happening. And that's pretty much it. You're going to flip over one of these dark arts cards, maybe two, depending on the level of the game. You're going to address any attacks that the villains might do directly on you. And then you're going to go through your cards. You can play out your cards like a standard deck builder. Um, gain your attack and your money. You're going to purchase new cards. You're going to make an attack. And, and that's it. It's very straightforward. But again, this is just dripping with theme for Hogwarts or Harry Potter fans. And it's very simple to uh, pick up and understand. And for me, it was an excellent introduction into the deck building genre. So that's why it's my number 10. Okay, so the next game on my list, number nine, is uh, I don't actually own anymore. Uh, and that, But that game is Battle Masters. It was released by Milton Bradley. Uh, way back in the early 90s and um, it essentially was my first introduction into a kind of a, you know it's essentially like a it's called an epic fantasy uh, battle game um, but it had miniatures it had a ton of miniatures it came in this huge box I remember just being so excited about all the content that was inside the box and um, really just um, being enamored with putting the miniatures together, adding all the stickers, putting them out on this huge, it was like a five foot by five foot map probably. I mean, I, I remember it being bigger than me when uh, I had laid the, it was kind of like a vinyl mat um, out on the floor and put all the miniatures out there. I was not into painting yet. I was, you know, just a kid, but I remember just being enamored with those miniatures. And I think that that game really kind of opened my eyes to how cool miniatures in a game could be because I will admit I am a fan of any game right now that has miniatures you know that's usually a catch-all for me uh, in Kickstarter and now I love to paint them and, and so on and so forth so let's take a quick look at um, Battle Masters on the Board Game Geek website here just so you guys can see and maybe remember what um, Battle Masters may have entailed Okay, so here you can see uh, Battle Masters came out in 1992. Um, it was, it says publishers, all those names, but it was essentially a Milton Bradley game. And uh, it, it doesn't have a huge score. It's got a very easy complexity rating. Um, but I think just from what I remember, um, it, it says down here, presumably licensed from Games Workshop. Uh, vinyl mat was four and a half feet square. Um, this game just had so much stuff in the box that it was just a, um, just a treasure trove of stuff for me to play with and put together. I don't know if I ever, but maybe once or twice played the game as it was meant to be played. I simply just, um, you know, got the miniatures out, set them up, had my own little battles. And again, just it, this inspired my, I, I believe, love of miniatures. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this game sat, once I started to get older, I kind of outgrew it and um, was no longer interested in the game, sat up on my shelf and eventually it was sold in a yard sale. There you can see kind of what all it would have entailed bringing in the box and um, yeah, just kind of the whole unboxing, uh, loving to, to see what's inside the box and being so excited about what's inside the box. Um, yeah, I just have such fond memories of this game and so that's why it made it onto my number nine. Okay, so for my number eight, uh, it is a much more modern game and by a designer that Many of you may know, if you don't, I suggest you go out and find his stuff, but this one, number eight, happens to be uh, Above and Below. This is a game by Ryan Lockett, 
And for me, this game is on my list because it was the very first Kickstarter that I ever participated in for a board game. Um, I had done a few Kickstarters for digital games up until that point. And this one, um, I honestly had no idea kind of that major producers, major players in the board game industry would even use Kickstarter. I thought that this Ryan Lockett guy, you know, my name is Ryan, so I had a kinship with him there. But um, this is the first game I backed on Kickstarter and I had no clue what to expect when it was finally delivered. Um, and I was just so blown away by the production value and I later learned, oh, Ryan Lockett, this was not his first foray into the board game industry, but I was still so impressed with what I could gain as a reward on Kickstarter that this really just like, you know, sent me off and, and to this day I am a huge fan of Kickstarter and supporting games that I believe in on Kickstarter. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at uh, Above and Below by Ryan Lockett. Okay, so here is Above and Below, and just uh, for those of you who might not know, the map that I pretty much keep on my table at all times because it is so beautiful. This mat that's from Game Toppers, uh, the Game Toppers 2.0 Kickstarter, is a Ryan Lockett designed uh, game mat. Uh, it's a big 3x3 three three game mat, and you know I put it underneath almost all my games, whether the setting fits or not. But this is above and below, and I can remember the day that it arrived in the mail because I had kind of forgotten about it. Um, and here this box comes in the mail. I'm like, who? I don't even know. What's Red Raven Games? Where did this even come from? And I opened it up. I was like, oh, this is the game I kickstarted. Look at this. And I was just so blown away by the production value that I was like, this is something that you would get at a, at a store. And again, I did not realize that Ryan Lockett was an old hat at this, but what really drew me to Above and Below was this, uh, he calls it in this one, an encounter book. But the encounter book is just filled with stories. And at the time, I was really into gaming with my friends. We would meet a lot. We'd play a lot of Catan, things like that. And I was always looking for just a new game that would be really fun um, to introduce to the group. And this is essentially a worker placement game. Um, but you can see here, there's all these character tiles that are gonna give you various bonuses. Um, and so each turn you essentially are deciding whether or not uh, you want to go exploring, whether you want to gather food, build a house, uh, try and recruit another character. I honestly can't remember what this symbol is, but uh, it's essentially a, a Euro style game. It's a worker placement game, but the cool thing about it is, is that you can build these um, huts, like, you know, you can build all these different style houses that give you beds. The beds allow you to rest your people at night. Um, but then, I gotta find some of them here. Where are all me? Here we go. Then you have these underground cavern cards that can be built underneath. Um, so as long as you have something built up top, you can start building underneath, which is hence where the above and below monikers come from. So you can actually start delving into the caverns and that's where you go exploring, is you go exploring down below to figure out um, where, uh, what what is beneath you and, and learn, learn about the world below you. So. Uh, it's very straightforward, uh, pretty simple to uh, pick up Euro game. But again, this was my first foray into Kickstarter. And for somebody who had never backed a game on Kickstarter before, this one was really just uh, incredibly um, um, amazing to me. And I am since a huge Ryan Lockett fan. I love this uh, shared world that he... He has all his games kind of appear in this above and below world. And I love the art style. I love the world. I love what he does now with adventure books. I love Near and Far. Sleeping Gods is coming out later this year and I'm hoping it's just gonna be a blast. So again, that was Above and Below by Ryan Lockett was my, what was that, number eight. Okay, so my number seven on the list is one that lots of people should be familiar with, and that is Settlers of Catan. Um, 
you know, this is just the base game and that's what I have played the most of over the years. Um, but Can Catan was really the first Euro game, the first heavily strategy game that I was introduced to um, by some friends of mine. And it's when we would be getting together a lot to play games in the evenings, but usually it was things like uh, Cards Against Humanity or Apples to Apples or uh, I can't even remember what we used to play that much, but then one night, um, some friends of mine brought over friends of mine brought over Catan. They had already played it with half the group already, and I was just like enthralled with the amount of strategy involved and how into the game you could get. And everybody seemed to be into it, um, both the you know boyfriends and girlfriends, and um, you know it didn't matter. It, it seemed to be a game for everybody. Um, and I had a large game group at the time, so it didn't matter that you had to have at least three people to play it. Um, but I remember buying my copy and trying to figure out how to play solo or how to play two-handed with or two players with my wife. But we would just get this game out uh, constantly. So real quickly, for those of you who may not be familiar with Catan, let's take a look at this. All right, so this is Catan. Um, I, I don't know what version this is or how old it is. We always used to joke that um, whoever lost would have to put this bumper sticker on their car, but it never got placed there. Um, so yeah, you can see this has traveled around a lot, but for those of you who may or may not be familiar with um, the uh, how to play, you're essentially building this map uh, of tiles that uh, hexagonal tiles and, and you set up this map. These create the borders. And then you, everybody gets their own color and you're essentially gaining resources because you stake claim, you get to put houses down um, on these tiles and you can see each tile represents a different resource. Um, so it's been such a long time since I've had to explain Catan to anyone. So this is like a desert, so this doesn't represent anything, but there's forest. Okay, so if you have a house on one of these bordering areas of forest, and then every tile gets a little number chit on it, so you can see that, um, you know, it's, it's you roll two D6s, and so 12 is the highest number. If you say there's a 12 on here, and the person rolls a 12, you're going to get uh, forests, uh, a forest resource. So um, there's plains for sheep, there's rock, um, wheat, and it really just comes down to a random die roll where whoever's turn it is rolls the dice, here are the two dice, and they call out the number and you get to collect um, uh, whatever resources you might have already staken a claim to. And you're essentially it's been a long time. I guess, yeah, I must have some uh, Seafarers expansion in here. Um, essentially, you collect those resources and then you use them to build more roads uh, so that you can connect out and then build another house. And your house has to be two, two spots away and then you can upgrade your houses to cities, which means you're doubling the resources. And it, it again, is just a very straightforward um, Euro and it's a very classic euro um it's not even really a worker placement i don't know if i'd call it a worker placement um but yeah this is Catan. this is what some people consider to be the great gateway game and it was for me um you know just introduced me to all of these like strategy board games that weren't just monopoly and weren't ones that just were easily found on the shelf at target uh so i really got into things that made me think when I was playing a board game uh, with Catan. So that was my number seven. All right, my number six is a game that I went searching for after uh, I really got into Catan. And I wanted to pick a game that I enjoyed the theme, but also one that my group of friends would enjoy playing as well. And I remember being drawn to two things about this game. One was that it was cooperative, and I had no idea what that was like. I didn't even know that type of game existed. But also there was the trader mechanic that my friends really, really got into and really enjoyed. So that game is Shadows Over Camelot. 
Um, I remember Small Wonders, or, I mean Small World, coming out and being really interested in that game. And I think it was my now at the, at the time he wasn't, but now currently my brother-in-law had Small World, and he had a little catalog of the games that you could purchase from Days of Wonder. And here is Shadows Over Camelot, and I really like the King Arthur theme. Uh, it's a theme that really speaks to me. And I just really thought that the whole cooperative aspect so that everybody got along, you know, there wouldn't be any more fights at game night, but except for the trader mechanic, I have a few of my friends who really enjoy playing the bad guy anytime that opportunity is there. And so here was Shadows Over Camelot that just it checked all my boxes. And so I went out on a limb completely you know, almost sight unseen buying this game. And it didn't, my friends weren't super into it as far as the game group was concerned, but I remember just falling in love with this game. <coughs> and it became uh, not only my first introduction to cooperative games, but it also, it's a game that I first started playing solo um, by myself. Cause I was like, oh, I can play two handed. Let me see, I wanna play this game more, but my game group doesn't seem to be too into it. Let's see if I can, since it's cooperative, it doesn't matter um, which cards I have. And I, you know, started looking on Board Game Geek some more and just learned how other people were doing it and then learned and taught myself how to play two handed solo. And now I do it all the time. So let's take a look inside at Shadows Over Camelot. All right. So here is Shadows Over Camelot. And again, this is almost like a kind of a rummy style game. Um, it's got these great modular, I guess they're not really modular, but um, you know, here's the rule book. And then the book of quests really just kind of goes into the various quests that you can go on in more detail. Um, so you can see here, like for example, here is the quest for the Holy Grail. And you have to fill up, uh, get, once you get Grail cards in your hand, you have to move from... Uh, fill up this whole area with with cards but if the grail symbol comes up um, and the bad and the negative cards then it's removing cards and things like that um, here are all the various uh, player cards and this was the first time I was also introduced to asymmetrical hero powers so you can see here that each uh, character has their own special power um, and they have their own special power and what they gain when they gain the Holy Grail, if they gain Excalibur, if they gain Lancelot's armor. So here are all of these um, excellent people. And also, you know, on the back side is what they would flip over if they become, if they get past the traitor card. Um, you can see here, here is um, the quest for Excalibur. So again, you're trying to move out here and it starts here and so you need to progress your night out here by playing Excalibur cards. But at the same token, the Excalibur can be slowly pulled over to the dying shore and eventually get frozen in place. Um, you know, and these are all just various quests that you can go on. Here's the dragon one that uh, you essentially are playing, like I said, Rummy, uh, a run of three, B and C, and your runs have to be, your groupings, um, or runs or pairings have to be higher than the total um, amount of cards that have been drawn out for the dragons. So again, there's all these boards that represent different quests. They're all laid out at the same time. Um, after Battle Masters, um, which I had long since forgotten about at the time, this is the first game I got where there were miniatures involved. So here are these really cool, it's no longer like a wooden meeple like a tan. Um, there's these really cool miniatures to bring out onto the board and even for the bad guys um, So there's the trays that you come out with and so essentially every round you are flipping over one of these um, uh, Kind of encounter cards so you would see here this one that is played as the black knight and you can either play it um, face down which means that everyone else around you doesn't know what it is but it, and again, if you go to face the Black Knight, you're going to be, see here's the Black Knight's board. And so as the Black Knight adds cards here, and you can see this one is a one, whoever draws this card looks at it and they say, well, I either want everyone to know this is a one or I really need to draw a card myself. So I'm gonna place it face down. 
but since I'm on everybody's team, I just placed a one face down. So that's not one anybody should be worried about. And when someone comes out here and they put cards into the A stack and the B stack, then um, the total of these two combined needs to be greater than what the knight has accumulated. So if you were able to get out here really fast and put four cards down, then you're almost certainly beating the one. If it was flipped over, then you would know exactly what you have to beat. Now, if you were the trader, however, you may flip this over and see a six and be like, ooh, I want to put this face down so nobody can see it. And I'll just think, make everybody think that I am playing it to gain a white card and it's really a one. Um, so there is a little bit of hidden information. So it's not a true solo game in that aspect, even though it is cooperative. You consider all these dice to roll, things like that. And then essentially you're really just drawing up a bunch of uh, cards into your hand here that um, are gonna allow you to go out and play certain things. Here's a Merlin card, which is like a special action card. But here you can see that they're really just numbers. So it really just all comes down to uh, playing rummy style. You know, do you need a, a run? of three, so then you'd need a one, two, and a three. Well, I don't have a one, two, and three. Or do you need three of a kind? So there I've got three fives, that would be really good. There's also the grail cards in here. So these are the cards that you would wanna play in order to advance the grail. Um, and I can't remember how you advance on Excalibur. And all the rest of them are fights, and you're fighting like the Celts and the yeah grail cards reinforcement. So there's a couple other cards in here that just gain you benefit from certain actions. But essentially that's all it is. You're just drawing up cards until you feel like you have what it takes to go out on a quest. But every turn, the longer it takes, every turn something bad is going to happen. So the picks come out and they advance their army. And the Mists of Avalon, this is uh, from now on the lost each lost quest adds an additional black sword. Um, there's the Black Knight. Um, Excalibur, move Excalibur one spot closer to defeat. Um, so each time something comes out, you don't quite know which quest is gonna become a little bit harder, um, but it will. And these are essentially just the cards, the trader versus regular. So you've got a bunch of loyals and a single trader card. You hand these out based down at the beginning game if you want to play with that style. So again, this is Shadows Over Camelot. Uh, it's from Days of Wonder. It can be found. Um, but it can be a little difficult to find. They are kind of rarity because I don't think Days of Wonder is printing it anymore. So highly recommended as a cooperative game, uh, can be played solo. I, now that I'm getting all these pieces out here and, and checking it out again, I may even attempt to play this on the channel. So this again was Shadows Over Camelot, which was nine number six. So we are on to number five now. My number five is an older game, but it's one that uh, is still in print. It's been around for a long time. And this one represents family pastimes for me. Uh, and that game is Tripoli. Tripoli is a game that uh, includes a little bit of poker, a little bit of Michigan rummy, um, and a little bit of hearts. So, um, you know, this is kind of a family classic. And for me, Tripoli was just the game that if I had relatives in town, if we were staying up at my grandmother's lake house, we'd play Tripoli. Um, you know, we'd find a way to play even if we didn't have poker chips. Uh, all you need is a deck of cards, really. We knew what the mat looked like. Uh, we, I remember one time we didn't have the mat, we didn't have poker chips, but we had a deck of cards. And so we played with dried beans as the poker chips and we just drew on pieces of paper. My dad had it memorized and he drew on small sheets of paper what each of the uh, ante spots were on the mat and just put those pieces of paper out and we anteed our beans up onto the pieces of paper. So just this is, um, you know, my family's go-to game as far as family game nights were concerned. And so I just have a lot of fond, fond memories of this game. It is uh, for ages eight and up. Um, this is my personal copy that I have bought since I have been an adult. Uh, so you can see that it is still relatively new um, and you can still get this game 
pretty easily at on Amazon and Target and Walmart. So let's go ahead and just take a look at what's okay. Inside. So Tripoli again is a mixture of Michigan Rummy Hearts and Poker. Um, essentially, you have this very straightforward rule book, but you have this. This one has a deluxe mat. I remember the one that we grew up with had like a vinyl mat. But um, you know, you can see here. Might be better if I pull out the box of poker chips. Okay, this is really all that you need to play. Oh, that's upside down. Okay, there we go. So you can see here that at the beginning of every turn, you. Uh, are gonna deal out cards to everybody, and no matter what, you need to put, and you're really just anteing up one uh, chip per section on this outer ring. And then you're gonna deal out the entire deck of cards to the amount of people that are playing. So there may be people who have more cards than others, but it should only be like one extra card. Then you're going to play a can't remember which order it goes in, but essentially you're gonna play around a poker where you're gonna bet then into the center pot and the winner gets the center pot. And um, then you're going to play like this kind of reverse game of Michigan Rummy where you are, uh, somebody starts with like the two of spades and you go around and you go two and three. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is there's always a dummy hand dealt. And so you are, you deal one extra hand than there are per players, and there is the opportunity to um, bid on that dummy hand if you don't really like your hand. But anyways, you will, once the, the poker, and everybody's always gonna have really good hands because they have way more than five cards in their hand, so they get to pick and choose what five cards they're gonna use. Um, but then you really just kinda go around and you start with the two of spades, see the two of spades, the two of clubs, and you go two, three, four, and you're laying down your cards as um, people are making their way around. Now, if you happen to have either the ace or you are the last person to play a card before the dead hand uh, rears its ugly head, you get to then choose where you start the next uh, counting phase. And so you could start all the way over at the 10 of hearts. Say you really want to, to get your hearts out there or you maybe don't have any hearts, so you move on to another suit and you're playing like aces over and over and over again. But uh, essentially it keeps going around like that. And anybody that can play the 10 of hearts would claim this pile. Jack of hearts would claim this pile. If you have the king and the queen, you would claim this one. Otherwise you're just claiming this. And so any pile that's not claimed in a specific round just continues to grow and grow and grow. So like eight, nine, and 10, all in one suit, king and queen. Um, and, and so it's really just a very straightforward game. It's very easy for kids to pick up and play, but I've just had so much fun playing this in the past that I highly recommend it for any family out there, uh, especially in the current climate with COVID-19 happening. Um, you know, if you need a great game to play with the family, um, honestly, just, to, you don't even need to buy this mat. Like I said, just draw these things things out on uh, some pieces of paper and look up the rules online and then you just need some poker chips or some kind of counters and uh, a deck of cards and that's it so that is triply my number what was this my number five yes my number five okay my number four is actually two games um, i'm only going to bring one up here on to the table um, but essentially these games are very similar. One was uh, really just a retheming of the original game. And um, at the time I had, you know, my friends and I had got me into Catan. I had um, purchased Shadows Over Camelot and here are uh, opportunities for me to, I wanted to get games that I could play solo. I really wanted something that, you know, would make me think, but also tell a story. Um, I didn't want a Euro. I was really curious about, you know, this Ameritrash themed game and just dice chucking and, you know, knocking down monsters. I wanted to play D&D, but I didn't want to get into a group. So I wanted a dungeon crawler, uh, an Ameritrash dungeon crawler. And I was looking around at what everyone recommended the best ones to be. And here was Fantasy Flight Games. And they had had these games out for a while but had just released their uh, companion apps 
to enable you to play them solo. And so these two games that I received at the same time, I asked for them both uh, one year for my birthday. And I said, you know, this is all I want. I just want these two games. And so I received Descent Second Edition and Star Wars Imperial Assault uh, on the same day. And I was in heaven. Um, I just had, first of all, I'm a diehard Star Wars fan. And so Imperial Assault is why this one gets the slight nod over Descent, but I'm also really big into the fantasy theme. But Star Wars Imperial Assault um, is, you know, for me, Star Wars in a box. Uh, I also have Rebellion, which I know a lot of people say is Star Wars in a box, and X-Wing is Star Wars, but I have all of them because I love Star Wars. But for Imperial Assault, here was this game that I could play solo. I could kind of recreate my own Star Wars stories, uh, play through this adventure. It had dice chucking, um, all these cool miniatures. Um, and then eventually Star Wars Imperial Assault became the first game that I started to paint. And so I had never thought that I would be into painting miniatures. Um, I thought it was just too much work and I was perfectly fine with the gray and beige plastic that, you know, or Descent had the red monsters and the white monsters, things like that. I was perfectly fine with that. And then all of a sudden one day I was just, I really want to paint these. I guess I had seen playthroughs of other people pay, um, playing with them painted. I had watched a couple of Sarastro's YouTube videos on how to paint this particular game. And I was like, I think I could do that. And so that Christmas, I asked for nothing but stuff to, to pick up on hobby painting. So Imperial Assault not only got me into, you know, like the dungeon crawling and the, the more solo gaming, more in depth into solo gaming, but it also got me into painting miniatures, which is now a huge part of my hobby. So let's take a quick look at Star Wars Imperial Assault. Okay, so as I said before, Star Wars Imperial Assault is really just a retheming of Descent Second Edition, but with a Star Wars theme. I own them both, and I consider both of them to be equal on this list. Um, so this is kind of a hodgepodge mess of stuff here. You can see that this box contains all of my kind of smaller map tiles there and some of my health trackers. Um, here are some of the larger map tiles and we'll take a look at those in a second. But, um, you know, this was actually also one of the first games that I attempted to organize really well. Um, so I went out and I found this bead landing storage box from Michaels so that I could have all my tokens out near me but not just piles on the table and it really helped keep me organized and i use these now in almost uh, every storage solution that i create and then here you can see a whole bunch of rule books um here's a deck box that i printed off and, and built myself for all the mini cards here's the full size cards i, I really need to go back in and do a better job of organizing this game um, but here you can see this is the first time I was like ooh I really need to protect my minis and so I went out and bought an uh, even bigger box um, but I just you know I've had such a blast painting up these miniatures that has led to me painting almost all of my games now I haven't gotten to all of them and you can even see here that I have not come back around and painted everybody I painted all the bad guys but I still need to come back and paint all the heroes um, but I, I remember starting with the stormtroopers. There's an imperial guard there. Um, I started with stormtroopers because that was the very first video that Sarastra had on his um, Star Wars channel, and these are probably some of the worst paint jobs I, I did. I remember trying to make the elite, the, or the guys who would be the elite stormtroopers. Give them, make them look more like the clone troopers in Star Wars, the animated, Clone Wars the animated series. I think I did okay, um, but uh, I, I could certainly do better now. So there's the, the miniatures. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with a game like Imperial Assault or Descent, you know, essentially you have these map tiles that are all eventually going to clip together like this um, to create areas and this is a bad example because this is like a forest right next to what looks like the inside of a Death Star but you are really just kind of moving around your miniatures and positioning them 
on the board and when you get either within range or line of sight to have a ranged weapon or right up next to each other to use a melee weapon you roll some dice and where were all my dice and one of the great things about this system that's in both descent and imperial assault is this dice system which could look very complicated but essentially each one of these dice um has different icons on them and different chances of specific icons so depending on whether you have a ranged weapon or a melee weapon you might be rolling different colored dice and you can see some of these have like here's two successful hits plus a range of four so you know you could hit something four spaces away you're going to hit it for two hits um there are these squiggly icons which are surges which enable you to do like additional abilities and action cards that are either on your weapon or your actual hero card and this black one and there's a white one these triangular symbols are blocks so you're rolling your dice at the same time as they are and so you would say okay well this negates this attack right there and it's, but he's still hitting me for one two three plus he's got two surge opportunities to do something against me um if you happen to roll this one you uh the person misses altogether but so that's really it um but you keep getting to upgrade your character so it's very it has this rpg-esque feel to it um you're adding to your weapons then you can modify the weapons and it really just is a great experience for anyone who is into star wars or for if you're more of the fantasy realm like dwarves and elves and rogues and things like that then then go with descent um but the really the only downside um that i ever found with playing the game was just kind of attaching these tiles together to create the room so they could adventure on which is why i've really been drawn to adventure book games recently where you just turn the page and there everything is laid out in front of you so but this is star wars imperial assault this is and along with descent second edition this was my number four okay so number three is uh, a beast many of you may be able to guess at this point which uh, game that specifically it is uh, it's on a lot of people's top 10 list uh, for solo game group gaming whatnot it's the biggest game in my collection and that is gloomhaven um gloomhaven was a kickstarter that i bypassed i skipped over on uh it seemed too expensive to me i could not understand the concept of a euro inspired dungeon crawler um but then after its initial release i was just like what did i do this game is awesome everybody loves this game it is everywhere everyone's talking about it and so i uh remember tracking down a copy after the actually the second kickstarter it took that long for it to, to register with me but was able to track down a copy that was being released around the same time that the second kickstarter copies were, were being delivered I guess it was like a, a pre-order that I did from um, some hobby store. Uh, I can't remember which one, but uh, Bloomhaven is on this list because first of all, it is probably the biggest, most epic game that I own. And it is also, you know, at the time, easily the most amount of money I had spent on the game, which... Um, it can seem a little ridiculous to some people, but there is a lot of content in this game. And I have been playing this game off and on consistently for two and a half years now. And so I've definitely gotten my money's worth out of it. And, but also this game was the first game that I was like, oh, I want to sleeve these cards. I want to organize it really well. I had already seen people do unboxings and talk about how there wasn't a place to put everything. I wanted to be able to create something that would allow me to store it easily get it to the table easily and i wanted to show that off i wanted to i was on a mission to create a storage solution for gloomhaven that i was proud enough to show off and i was successful with that and this was really my first true youtube video i had posted some stuff to youtube prior but it was nothing serious and now here i have posted my gloomhaven storage solution video and it is to this day my highest ranking video on my youtube channel it just skyrocketed up in views and 
probably opened me up to what it was like to create content for YouTube. And so now here I am today creating a top 10 video for you guys. So I uh, attribute Gloomhaven for my desire to create content to share on YouTube. So um, I am not gonna open this one up because it is a beast and there's so much stuff in here. And honestly, if you don't know about Gloomhaven, you're probably watching the wrong video at this point. Um, but I have extensive coverage of my storage solution on my YouTube channel. So just check that out. Uh, if you want to see the storage solution in detail, I have backed Frosthaven on Kickstarter and I am eagerly awaiting that big giant box so that I can put my own storage solution twist into Gloomhaven now. And a lot of my videos early on on my YouTube channel were of storage solutions, um, because I enjoyed it so much with Gloomhaven and I feel like I, you know, nailed it as far as it worked well, it fit in the box, gets it in and off the table quickly. Um, it just worked. But Gloomhaven, for obvious reasons, is a very influential game to me, but almost more because of the storage solution that I created for it and then my jump into the YouTube uh, creator content. Last two games on my list are some oldies, but some goodies. Uh, and this one here that is my number two is probably the oldest game on my list. Uh, it is older than Battle Masters, which I believe was 1992. Uh, I am honestly not sure when this game came out, but I'm pretty sure it's older than me. It's still in print though. It's a mass market game. And that is Stratego. Now Stratego is a like I said, a mass market game. It's a very straightforward game, but the reason it is on my list as an influential game in my life is because this was the first game that I can remember getting really into and like thinking about at home, sitting around thinking about the game when I wasn't actually playing. Um, in my fifth grade classroom, there was a copy of Stratego. And whenever you got to school, you were allowed to pull out certain things and the board game collection was one of them prior to the bell ringing. And my mom was also a teacher. So I was always at school early unless I was you know, lucky enough to walk to school one day, but I was almost always at school literally before the bell that let people into the school. So I was always one of the first people in my classroom essentially. And I would rush to the shelf, snag Stratego off almost every single day and one or two of my friends would always come in soon thereafter and we'd sit down and we'd play Stratego. Winner gets to stay and we'd just play as many games as we could in the 20 minutes or so before the bell rang. And then if it was indoor recess, we were playing Stratego again. And I probably played this game easily a hundred times over the course of that fifth grade year. And I just have such fond memories of it. Um, I remember just strategizing about where to put that bomb, where to put the spy, um, and just thinking about this game so much outside of school or outside of those mornings that uh, it has really just stuck with me to this day. So for those of you who are not familiar with Stratego, let's take a quick look here. Okay, so this is an older copy. This is not the copy that I played with in school, obviously, but this is my copy from my childhood. So uh, this one is very precious to me, uh, and it is, you know, they continue to print this uh, game, um, and they have d different themes of the game, but um, and probably the, the graphics have gotten better, but essentially you have this map uh, that's very straightforward, and there's these two areas in the center that you can't enter, but... What you're gonna do is you're gonna line up your army in these first three rows right here in whatever form or fashion that you choose. Now the trick is, is that you have all these little uh, castle pieces. They all look the same. They're all identical in your color. So let's pull some out here. And, but they're all just blank on the backside. So this is a game like Battleship where you have to sit across from the person, you have to sit across from the board and there's no cheating, no looking at the other side. And so you're going to take your pieces and you're going to line them up however you so choose in any one of these first three rows. So you'll sit them like this so that only you can see them, you can see the number, and your opponent cannot. 
then on your turn, you're simply going to take one of your pieces and you're gonna move it either forward or backward if you have the ability. Obviously at the beginning, everything's gonna be moving forward or you could also move one to the right or the left. That's it, that is all you do uh, on your turn. Super, super straightforward and simple. Um, and then once this guy's up, you can start moving guys from the back and, but that's it. Everybody can only move forward, backward, right or left if there is open space. Now, the trick to it is, is that when you come face to face with a, another miniature, you are looking to have the lower number. So let's start off with this example here. This would be turned this way. And say my guy, my five guy here of red approached my nine of blue. We wouldn't be able to see each other's, but we're face to face, so we're gonna battle. And you really just reveal what your number is. And you say, oh, five is the lower number. It's the more powerful person. I defeat the nine. It's taken off the board. Simple as that. Then you flip it back over. Well, then say, for example, I'm the blue player and I know I have my four here. I know what that guy is. So then I'm going to advance up here in my next two turns and I'm going to fight. Well, now it's five against four. So I've taken this one off the battle. So you may say, if you look here on the board, you can see the breakdown of the people. You can see that there is in fact a one. And I believe there is only one one. And there's like two twos and three threes and there's a whole bunch of nines. Um, but the why wouldn't you just run around only moving your one and killing off everybody? Well, there's a few things that can kill a one. One is the spy. Now the spy can take out anybody as long as they are doing the attacking like a sneak attack. But if someone attacks the spy, if someone moves adjacent to the spy first and attacks them, the spy is defenseless. There are also bombs that cannot be moved. Let's see what this, let's get a spy and where's my flag? Okay. So here's the spy. You know, the spy, as long as the spy is doing the attacking uh, and you only have one of them, then there are these bombs which just stay put. But there's so many pieces on the board. If pieces aren't moving at the beginning, especially, you're not even going to notice. Um, and so these bombs, again, are faced towards you. And anybody that attempts to defeat a bomb gets blown up. And you remove the bomb and the person from the board. Except for the miner. Now, if you're a miner, you can approach a bomb and defuse it. And I actually, I'm saying this now that the bomb is taken off the board. I think the bomb actually stays put. And then you have to bring in a number eight miner to defuse the bomb. And then last but not least is you have your flag. Your flag is the most strategic decision you will make as to where to put your flag at the beginning of the game. Do you put it here and surround it by bombs? Do you get really cocky and put it right here on the front row in the very center? Um, you know, where this flag is, is everything to your strategy because you're the objective is for you to march down to your opposition side and find the flag. And if you become adjacent to the flag and attack it and they reveal the flag, you're the winner. So that is Stratego in a nutshell. It is a game that's been around for a super long time. It's only a two player game. It's just head to head. Um, but the and it's very straightforward for kids to learn how to play, but the strategy involved in this game is immense and it is a classic in my opinion. So I highly recommend this one. It can be found almost anywhere. It can be found used in a lot of places. It's got themes that you may be interested in. So find one of those, find this game and start playing it. That was my number two, Stratego. <laughs> All right, and the final game on my list, my number one most influential game in my life of all time is probably one that many of you have never even heard of. But I guarantee you, if you are familiar with the board game industry, you are familiar with the designer. Um, but if you're familiar with the designer, you probably had no idea that he created this game. Um, when I was in high school, my friends and I stayed out of a lot of trouble having game nights. Uh, we weren't into like Dungeons and Dragons D&D or anything like that, but we would get together and 
play games a lot. There was a lot of party games, things like that, and, and just stay out of trouble in general. Uh, a lot of people we knew in high school were off drinking, underage, things like that, and we just just had our own fun. And so for years, in our tight little group of friends, we would say to each other, all right, our Christmas gifts are going to be board games that we can play at our game nights. And so we would kind of do a kind of Secret Santa-esque type thing where we would each get someone else's name, but you knew you were buying a board game, you knew you were getting a board game, and they essentially just became like community games because they, we always had them out at whoever's house we were playing at. We always brought the others along. So uh, there was a tiny little uh, game board shop that was in our area. It was near a Walmart, and so a lot of people didn't even bother going in there. If they wanted a mass market game like Monopoly, they, they walked into Walmart. And I remember going in there to find, you know, the game I bought. And I believe this game was also purchased for me in this same store. But it was really my first foray into the kind of the hobby shops, um, the friendly local game stores, things like that. But this is a very simple game, but I have played it so much. I cannot even begin to count how many times I have played this game. And that is, what were you thinking? And for those of you that can read the designer, it's Richard Garfield. This game is by the same designer, gentleman, who created Magic the Gathering, which is easily the most recognizable game in the world, probably, and behind Monopoly, I guess, and, and the other mass market games. So, but Magic the Gathering, Magic the Gathering, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Garfield designed this cute little party game and uh at the time i guess he was working for wizards of the coasts because it's uh produced by wizards of the coast but this does not look like your standard wizards of the coast or richard garfield game but this is to me just some most amazing memories of high school and college you can see the box is all beat up i have taken this thing with me everywhere i've taken it on airplanes uh, vacations, things like that. And uh, I don't even know if it's, I'm pretty sure it's not in print anymore, but let's go ahead and take a look at what, what were you thinking in tips? Okay. So here again is my just, you know, beat to hell box because this game has gone with me in so many places. This was always a hit amongst our friends. Um, I'd always bring it to game nights and more often than not, it would get played. You can see that, you know, like the instructions have gotten wet. I've taken it camping, things like that. Um, it is incredibly simple to play. Um, yeah, see, it's like, it's a good thing I already know how to play. Um, but essentially all it is, there is a timer and there's all these deck of cards and you will spin the spinner. And the spinner will tell you what color you want. And that's all you need to know. There's also choose a question or make up your own question. Every card that you can draw has a dot similar to Trivial Pursuit next to it. And so if you rolled green or purple, you would read green or purple. Then you're gonna read out the question and everybody is going to, within the time limit provided, write down their answers to these questions. And what you are wanting to do is write down the same stuff as everybody else. So what were you thinking is kind of the opposite of like categories or many other games where you're trying to come up with a unique answer. Here you're trying to write down what other people were thinking. So list four brands of soda pop. Well, obviously you'd probably write Coca-Cola, Pepsi, but then, you know, where do you go from there? What are the other two you're going to list off? Uh, this one says in the movie, The Dirty Dozen, how many members of The Dirty Dozen were still alive at the end of the movie? So this one's tricky. And usually the red ones always list four, the blue one's always a number answer. Uh, the green one's usually always a yes or no or true or false. And then the purple one's name five things similar to red. And these two are probably the most fun, the listing ones, because then you go through and you essentially just say, all right, I had Coca-Cola. Well, everybody raises their hand with Coca-Cola. So you go around, you count up how many people you're playing with. All right, that answer got me six points. Uh, Pepsi, all right, say only three people said Pepsi. So you and those two other people each get three points for Pepsi. And once everyone's gone around and called out their own unique answers, you add up the score. And instead of whoever had the highest score being the winner for that round or getting a special card, 
the person with the lowest score is going to lose the round and they're going to get these fun little penalty cards which say various things that are just fun. Oh, the sun was in my eyes. They're kind of like excuses cards. Hey, did you hear Valor's making a comeback? Uh, they don't teach that at Harvard. No, no, you go on without me, I'll be fine. Um, these are just fun little penalty cards and essentially the game is played until one person accumulates however many penalty cards that you wanted to say the game length would be. So you could play to three and it would be a pretty quick game. You could play to five, seven, um, as many as you want, but essentially you're just going to have one loser in the game and everyone else is going to be a winner. I always thought that was funny. Um, but again, this game was a game that you could not find at Target or Walmart. Um, it was not a mass market game, but my friends and I played the ever living snot out of this game to the point where some people refused to play with us because we knew, we already knew each other. We were best friends and we knew each other inside and out. And, and so when you would say name four sodas, we would know that, you know, we're going to put Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Mr. Pibb, and Mountain Dew. Something like that. And each of us were guaranteed to get 16 points four times four. Um, I don't think I've ever lost a game of this in my life. Um, you know, that's not really bragging. That's just the amount of, of fun I've had playing it with uh, my close friends and, and people I know really well. And it also, this represents, this game represents one of my most cherished gaming memories. One of the first nights that we had this game and we're playing it, one of the very first questions that we came across was name five flowers. And so we're all writing down like rose and carnation and tulip and things like that. And the thing is that a lot of people need to remember is that you get a point for your answer no matter what. So even if you're the only person to write down, uh, say, carnation, you're still at least getting one point. So write something down. That can make the difference between getting one of these cards and not. And so we're all writing our names of flowers down and my buddy Joe has his list and I don't know if he was the last person to read through his list or what but he gets through and he's like okay yeah these two were already said by you guys and then I had um you know what's a, a flower that not many people think about I don't know a sunflower or something like that and he gets to his last two and he's like well then I had uh for my fourth one I had tiger lily and we're like tiger lily and this is a bunch of guys sitting around playing this game and we all just start laughing at Joe because it's like, who comes up with Tiger Lily? Like, that's that's the name of the, the Indian chick and in Peter Pan, but I'm pretty sure it is a flower. And what difference does it make? He's going to get a point for it no matter what. But we're all just like laughing and, you know, enjoying in the good fun. And they're like, okay, wait, wait a minute, Joe, wait a minute, Joe. That was your number four on your list. Sounds like you were really struggling. What was your number five? And Joe goes, oh, wheat. And I... I'm pretty sure I peed my pants laughing so hard. Um, it was just beyond one of the better moments uh, of my teenage years. Um, we laughed for like 20 minutes about that subject. And that night, that answer still comes up uh, between my buddies and I. We're still good friends. And we still talk about the night that Joe said tiger lily and wheat for his uh, top five flowers. So that is my top 10 list of most influential games. Again, number one was What Were You Thinking? It's a party game by Richard Garfield. Came out in 1998 by Wizards of the Coast. If you ever see a copy of this sitting on a shelf somewhere, pick it up immediately. Um, I, You're not going to get this copy from me. I will be buried with this copy. So... That, again, was the top 10 most influential games to me in my life uh, for the reasons I explained. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel, uh, if you, especially if you enjoyed this content and want to see more. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.